Simon Jacobson here, welcome to the multitudes, both here and the world, because remember, once the internet hit, potentially 7 billion people may be watching this. I know it's not likely, but hey, potential. So I welcome you. The class is uh, titled, How Deep Can You See? Perceiving the Superficial versus the Real. And is dedicated by, in honor of Arik and Aurelia Zander. Uh, so, as I've mentioned to a number of you, this class has been going on now for over 32 years, which um, I find to be quite amazing because I never set out and planned it that way. Um, it was literally a winter, cold winter night, Thursday night, I believe it was, back in 1982, long before um, email, smartphones, fax machines, the age of the dinosaurs, when uh, we began. Back in the previous century, I was like that, you know. We're now in the new century. And Sonny Goldstein, Oliver Shalom, and his good friend Michael Liebert, Oliver Shalom, they're both in heaven now, uh, hopefully, um, came to see me because Sonny Goldstein had, uh, had a mutual friend who suggested he come speak to me looking for some spiritual inspiration from Jewish sources. And we hit it off. It was a conversation. And the conversation is still going on now for 32 years. They brought some friends who brought more friends who brought more friends. A lot of people from the music and entertainment industry, especially in those early years. And basically, we never advertised this class. It was always word of mouth. So everyone that's ever entered this room, and we've been in a number of rooms as well. We've had plenty of migrations. Uh, from one place to another. I, I would estimate around 30, 35,000 people probably came to this class. We didn't count, we didn't even know, you know, we didn't, I didn't begin to uh, collect emails until emails, which was just a number of years ago. So it's been a journey, and uh, what was most fascinating for me, the growth that I went, was underwent is, as we read in last week's chapter, the idea of Lech Lecha, that Abraham, the first Jew, is told the commandment to leave his homeland, which is essentially going out of your comfort zone. You know, all growth happens when you're out of your comfort zone. When you're in your own comfort zone, which means your own environment, your own home, family, community, you uh, tend to um, stagnate. When you're challenged and you have to speak and interact with people that are not like yourself, you begin to shine. And uh, that's what I felt through those years, because I interacted with people who were very different from what I grew up with. And, um, and we're able to really have just real conversations that were not based on any common denominator as in family or community or even belief system. Uh, you know, I ended up being called by some people the rabbi for atheists, uh, whatever reason that was, I guess. Even a atheists need rabbis. Um, that's the only way I allow myself to be called a rabbi, if it's for atheists. If it's for the orthodox, uh, no, that doesn't work for me. So. Um, and the journey continued. I met here, Philip is sitting here. If I may say some Lashon Hara about Philip, was that um, we met, Philip was a devout Hindu, a Jew, but masquerading as a Hindu. And uh, it's a long story. And Philip has become uh, a scholar in his own right, has his own class every Thursday night now. And uh, what can I say? It's a very moving experience because when you... When souls intersect and you allow the and you allow it to be, to just uh, blossom without any agendas, and strings attached, and there's no business or money involved, it tends to bring out unbelievable magic, and I saw that in my own life with so many different people, so it's just a very moving thing, and I always feel it an honor to be part of the dignity and the dignity of journey of every soul. You know, we all have our journeys, our trajectory, some more bizarre than others. Everybody's journey is more or less bizarre in our day and age especially when you compare it to our parents and grandparents, you know, how we got here, how we came to this country, usually as a result of some miracle somewhere or some type of like coincidence or like, you know, this person just happened to survive when everybody else, God forbid, were killed in the pogroms or the, or the Holocaust. So in general, it's just a, um, a journey that uh, when you look at it, it's a majestic divine journey. And whether it's the twists and turns or ups and downs, to me it was, it was and it continues to be a unbelievable source of... Um, energy and pride to be able to be part of that type of uh, mystery of life's journey.
And everyone here knows, every one of you is on that journey your own way. So hopefully sitting here together we can uh, come away with, even though I'm doing the speaking, but as I always point out, you never know who's really doing most of the learning. I may be doing the speaking, but I may learn more from you than you from me. And it's about really more about the vibes and about the energy and about uh, give and take. And as I said, when you get the ego out of the way and you let the souls emerge, it tends to um, bring out things that you usually don't experience. Because we live in a world that's, let's face it, it's dog eats dog. It's a hostile world where ego, self-interest, materialism, money, and other forces taint so much of our lives. You know, so you want to really know what we're like in our, at our purest form, you have to look at ourselves as a child, as children. Because children, in the words of the Talmud, Hevel she'en bo'ichet, the Talmud in its own inimitable way describes uh, different, uh, different things in very unique ways, poetic, but also Hevel she'en bo'ichet is an expression in the Talmud, in, Shabbat, in, in the tractate Shabbos that says, Hevel means a breath that has no sin. Hevel. Which means it's a person who has not been jaded and not been tainted by um, and contaminated by the, by the forces of egos and self-interest and uh, basically duplicity and all the other factors that so, much, so, so, so many of us experience, especially as we grow into adults, including fears and insecurities and inhibitions and all the stuff that we're busy trying to unravel. Who knows, you know, how much energy does a human being invest not in building, but in fighting demons. You know, how much time do the demons occupy our minds, our hearts? I mean, you just look at this, the world of therapy. Is it trillions of dollars? I don't think you can even find statistics because most people don't, will not admit as much, the, much the time that they spend there. And also, how much time during the day? How many times are we fighting off fears, uh, whether real or not real? And, and not being able to focus on what, as we were as children, we were idealistic little creatures that that embraced everything with adventure and excitement, took on the world, and with all the idealism. And then slowly as we get older, the, I guess the graph will show that we, the spirit wanes as we become part of the, I don't know if I want to say part of the problem, but yeah, I would say sometimes we become part of the problem. So to me, Judaism has always been a universal approach for all people to free ourselves from these uh, trappings and from these uh, forces which is why, for example, you find in the Torah so much emphasis on the concept of leaving Egypt, Yitzhiz Mitzrayim. Not just Passover that we commemorated in the Seder, an eight, seven, eight days holiday, but literally every day, tens if not, of, not, tens if not hundreds of times, we mention Zeich Yitzhiz Mitzrayim. Zeich Yitzhiz Mitzrayim means to remember our leaving Egypt. We say it, we say it in the Shema, we say it in the, in the prayers, and it's, it's there everywhere. So many mitzvot, more than you may even imagine. Even Shabbat is connected to um, leaving Egypt. Why is that so fundamental? As the Talmud puts it, in every generation, and some say every day, one has to envision as if you left Mitzrayim. Now many of us have never been to Egypt. Why should we have to, you know, our, grand, our ancestors were there, fine. It's something you remember. We commemorate, we thank God for, for getting freed from that God-forsaken place. But why is it important to like, relive it as if we're leaving Egypt right now? And the answer is, if you know the Hebrew, it's very simple. It's because, um, because Mitzrayim in Hebrew means limitations. It means constrict, constrictions, it means constraints, inhibitions. Basically, Mitzrayim symbolizes much more than a country. It symbolizes every type of limitation, any inhibition, any force, any fear, insecurity that traps us. That's what Mitzrayim is. So it's not just remembering something that happened so long ago. It's about an experience that's happening right now. And um, every moment, if not every day, we are experiencing, we, we, we are commanded, we are compelled to leave our limitations. What else, what, what better way to define life than trying to free ourselves of the, the forces that, uh, the gravitational pull of the material world. In one word, it's called transcendence. Transcendence is the essence of every search and every journey, whether it's the journey that we call love and romance, whether it's sexuality, whether it's traveling, whether it's, um, whether it's uh, any form of entertainment. Everyone is looking to transcend the quotidian, the, the wear and tear of the daily grind and the routines and patterns. All that is Mitzrayim. So you fill in the blanks, every one of us has a Mitzrayim, and therefore it's such a core cornerstone of Judaism and cornerstone, frankly, of all type of growth. 
And Lech Lecha, when Abraham left his homeland, at 75 years old, as I discussed last week at length, that was considered, as the Arizal says, the beginning. Because Abraham's leaving his homeland would ultimately lead to the rest of the events that ultimately led the Jews to Egypt and finally leaving Mitzrayim. So when you think of it that way, Judaism takes on a whole different uh, context, a whole different significance, because it's really our journey right now. And to me, that's the bottom line. It's always been the emphasis of this class, which is the relevance. What is the personal and psychological, emotional relevance of these ideas? And it's only when you are able to find such relevance that, number one, you'll be able to find a passionate connection to Judaism. And number two, you'll be able to you'll, something that you'll want to pursue instead of something we do out of obligation or guilt or responsibility or just plain uh, whatever, uh, habit. And frankly, you don't like to be negative or critical. Today, if you divide the Jews into two groups, the affiliated and the unaffiliated, most of the affiliated, I would say, it's not necessarily a spiritual journey. It's a culture. You know, you grew up with it. I grew up with it. You do things, like every culture has all kinds of habits and routines and rituals. And the unaffiliated don't find any relevance, and they have their own culture. Whoever, whoever, any group you go to or all need this thing called relevance. Finding the personal, as I said, emotional relevance of the Torah teaching. And hence, the topic tonight is related to this week's chapter. Because last week's chapter was Abraham's journey, and this week's chapter is Abraham's vision. The chapter is called Vayera, where God appears to Abraham. This is the first time you have so-called the appearance of God to a human being. I mean, you have it somewhat in the Garden of Eden, but there it doesn't say he appeared. There you see he heard God's voice, and so on. So before we get into the details of this, um, obviously the big question, as I just asked, is who cares? What is the relevance of this story? It happened 3,800 years ago, 3,700 years ago. A man at 99, 100 years old, who determines to circumcise himself following God's command, and God comes to visit him. And uh, from where we learn, by the way, the laws of visiting the sick. We learn it from God coming to visit Abraham as he was healing in the sun in the desert of uh, Eleni Mamre, where he was sitting in front of his tent. And just for the, I've ta- discussed this in the past, but I just want to mention it because it's always a very powerful lesson. And then what happens next is Abraham looks up and he sees three nomads wandering, three nomads traveling in the desert. And he turns away from God and greets them. He did not know they were angels at the time. He thought they were Arabs. And he, in his conventional style, Abraham, the great Machnes Arach, the welcomer of guests, he welcomes them, welcomes them into his home, into his tent, and he offers them a meal. And then afterwards, they come and tell him the different piece of news. Number one, that uh, Sarah will have a child called Isaac, that uh, will be called Isaac. Number two, they, that, uh, that, um, that, uh, that they would come to also to destroy the wicked city of Sodom, etc. So here we also learn something interesting. This is somewhat of an aside note, but it's relevant to the discussion as well. We learn from this the power of welcoming guests. So from God visiting Abraham, you learn the the mitzvah of visiting the sick. And here's the welcoming of guests. And the Talmud says something really interesting. It says that welcoming guests in your home is greater than welcoming the Shekhinah. The Kabbalah's Pnei Shekhinah, welcoming God himself. How do we know this? Because Abraham turned away from God to welcome the guests. God came to visit him, he turned away. So here's the klotz I don't know if you ever heard the expression. Just silence the, the microphone. Not the microphone. The volume. I think you do it. it doesn't. The volume on the computer. That's all. Okay. So... Um, Can someone just help just shut the volume in the computer? You know anyone who knows how to do that? So um, the question, the klutz kasha, which means the obvious question is asked, we, know, we, we derive this lesson from Abraham. But how did Abraham know? How did Abraham know? God comes once in history to, some, to, to visit someone what chutzpah do you have, the nerve, to, uh, to um, turn away from God 
even if it's a regular guest, someone comes to visit you, is, is, it's a little rude to turn away from that person and go, with all good intentions in mind, to go turn to others. And here it's God coming to visit him, and here Abraham turns away. So the obvious answer is, because turning to guests was not turning away from God, it was another way of experiencing God. And God would have been happy that he did it, and that's why he did it. Abraham knew that if you love God, you also love God, what God created, his creatures. And not to be compassionate to a human being in the name of so-called your faith or your religion is not considered to be godly. That's more like selfish religion. So Abraham understood this instinctively. We learn it from Abraham that, that greeting guests, therefore, is greater than greeting God in the sense that it's a deeper way of experiencing the divine because it's not just about you. Like there's the famous analogy, they say there's two types of people. When it gets cold in the room, <coughs> you can t- put on a uh, fur coat. That's called a tzaddik and pelts. Or you can light a fire. I mean, uh, not, uh, not in an arson type of way. I mean, in a, like a, a fireplace. The difference is, uh, when you put on a fur coat, you get warm. No one else does. When you put on a fire, you light a fire, everybody gets warm. And that's what Abraham understood. That by greeting the guests, he's actually experiencing a divine in a deeper way. But what I want to talk about, this topic I've talked about a number of times in previous years. It's all archived. If you're interested, you can find it all online on YouTube or on our website, MeaningfulLife.com. But what I want to discuss is the, the vision itself, Vayera, this appearance of the divine, which, of course, begs the immediate question, what does it mean to see God anyway? You know, we hear about this a lot. God appeared to Abraham, to Moses, to this one, to that one. Did you ever have, do you ever see God, any of you? You know, is it even possible to see God? What is the significance of this? So there's actually a story with one of the Hasidic Chabad Rebbe's, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Shalom Zavber, who, uh, when he was a child of five, six years old, that's the way the story is told, five, six, he went in, his birthday is on the 20th of Cheshvan, which will be next week, uh, a little more than next week. This, but it was, it's the same week of Vayer, this chapter. And he went to his grandfather, who was the Tzemach Tzedek, the famous Tzemach Tzedek, for a blessing for his uh, birthday. As he walks into his grandfather's room, he begins to cry begins to weep. And his grandfather says to him, why are you crying? She said, I just learned in the Torah that God appeared to Abraham. And I'm crying because why doesn't he appear to me? That was what he said. The end of the story is that Samach Tzaddik said to him, when a Jew, a Tzaddik, determines to circumcise himself at age 100, he deserves that God appear to him. But the first half of the story is also fascinating. You know, most people, if you see them crying, usually it's because they're in pain or they may have stubbed their toe or someone insulted them or some type of other uh, uh, sad circumstance, a loss, a death, sometime. But how many people do you know will just cry because God didn't appear to them? I mean, we hear sometimes about tears of joy. Tears of joy, that something is so powerful it just brings you to tears. And there's something I'm sure all of us experience at times. You can just burst out in tears for no apparent reason. Actually, my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, I opened up with that line. That sometimes when you burst out in tears for no apparent reason, that's the voice of your soul. I mention it because a number of years after my book was published, um, someone pointed out to me that Kirk Douglas, there's a book called Climbing the Mountain, his own personal biography, and he writes about his own journey, his own journey, of course, born Jewish, but didn't live Jewish for a long time. And then later in his life, he began to explore it. But what happened was he had a stroke. And uh, when he had the stroke, he was basically paralyzed part of his body. And he would, couldn't stop crying at the time. And then he quotes and he says, and I didn't know, why am I crying like this? It wasn't like I was crying in pain. I wasn't in pain. It was just, I used to just cry. And someone gave me a copy of Toward a Meaningful Life. He writes this. And I was reading the opening line is, have you ever burst out in tears for no apparent reason? This is the voice of your soul. She so began wondering, is this the voice of my soul? And I began climbing my mountain. And hence the name of his book. You know, I'm just sharing it because how, you know, how, uh, how, how a line affects someone. Now actually, I took the idea from the Arizal. The Arizal, the Isaac, uh, the Isaac Luria, the great mystic, 16th century, Tzfas, 
maybe the greatest mystic of them all, um, says something very fascinating, that in the 10 days of tshuva, which is the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which we're coming from last month, it says, someone that does not cry during those days, their soul is not complete. Which opens up a whole new dimension of what tears are. Azor, the Zohar says that when Rabbi Akiva would hear secrets of the Torah, Zolgu Ein of the month, his, his eyes would drip with tears. His eyes would well up with tears. So there's a whole different series of tears that have nothing to do with pain and loss and death. It's tears that essentially touch you in such a deep place, whether it's an existential loneliness or it's just a sense of the awe of existence itself. Or in this case, the Rebbe Rashab at four, five, five, six years old, just sensed, he took it personally, he says, you know, he wants to see the divine. And he began to cry. So there is that aspect that, uh, that we learn from this. But what exactly does it mean to see the divine? You know, let's say we were flies on the wall during the time that God came to see <coughs> Abraham. What would we see? Would we see what Abraham saw? What, is, what does God look like? You know, now, I wouldn't ask the question if the Torah doesn't say that God appeared. If God didn't appear, so then we go back to the classical, uh, the non-anthropomorphic definitions of God. You can't apply these concepts to God. These are all metaphors, which here, I'm sure, it's as well. But it does use the word appear, vayera, which means vayera, which means to see. So what did he see? So let's go back to the story of Abraham himself, which, again, if you read closely, is actually the story of our own lives. It's really the story of our own lives. There's a fascinating text. And you could read it today. It's an also translated into English. It's Maimonides, Rambam. So the Rambam Sefer Halachas, the Rambam wrote many books, but his classic, his magnum opus, is called Mishneh Torah. And the Mishneh Torah, so he has, among, he, he codified, he's the first codifier of uh, Jewish law. Because if you know the Talmud, the Talmud is written as almost like an informal conversation and dialogue between the scholars and the sages. And it can very, like in any good dialogue and discussion, it goes off on tangents and comes back. It's like a very big, like a, as I said, an informal transcript of their discussions. The later uh, scholars, like the Rambam being one of the first or the first, codified it and gathered all the different parts of the Talmud and divided it into sections. So all the laws of Shabbos, for example, are in Hilchah Shabbos. All the laws of Yom Kippur, Hilchah Yom Kippur, etc. So though the Talmud also has tractates that are subject-oriented, you have a tractate called Shabbos, but if you read the tractate of Shabbos, the primary theme is Shabbat. But there's a lot of discussion about many other things because, as I said, in a, in a dialogue in, in the academies, this was a transcript and a documentation of the entire discussion. So the Ramam has a section called Hilchas Avedizara, the laws of idolatry. And this first chapter is a fascinating chapter to, to read. Just it's a, a, an unbelievable summation of history, actually of how human beings evolved in their thinking. And briefly, you can read it on your own, but briefly what he says is that in the beginning of time, human beings who were far less uh, corrupt, they sensed that there was a higher reality called God. And I, I, I often don't like to use the word God because God is so fraught with stereotypes. As I've mentioned many times, the story of Lev Yitzhak by Ditchever, the Lebed Ditchever Rebbe, um, he once said to a self-proclaimed atheist, you know, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. Which I think, you know, just succinctly captures a tremendous theme, and that is that many people who question or deny or are skeptical about God, you have to define what God is before you get into a discussion about it, because we all can be talking about different gods. Um, so he talks about this reality, a higher reality, that was Adam and Eve and the others that their children were aware of. But then, as time passed, people always want to have something that they can touch and feel, something on their terms. And what happened next was, so people said, God, God is invisible. It's a force that we cannot experience on a sensory level. So let us find some symbol. And they looked up into the heavens, which is usually where you look, and they saw stars, and they began to attribute different stars, began to become the symbolic so-called fingers of God. But that also is quite distant. Stars are very far from us. So as time passed, the next stage was they began to find things on Earth, different trees, different spaces, different stones. 
different uh, areas, geograph geographical areas, that they identified that this area is connected to this star, which in turn is God's, again, God's footprints, or God's fingers, if you want to put it. And then came the commercialization of it all. Oh, once you already have an area that some people are identifying as being somewhat spiritual or divine, let's build a sanctuary around it, and let's charge people for coming in. And there began the beginning of what we call established religion, um, where it became a, uh, an, an opportunity, you can say. Some people may have had pure intentions, but many didn't. And then became priests, that if you want to have this connection, you have to come to us, we're the experts. And hence was the birth of Avedazar, idolatry. That instead of it, where it began was just finding a symbol to, to relate to God, the symbol became the God. And now it wasn't even the stars anymore, it was items on earth. It began the worship of stones, of trees, sun worship, moon worship, star worship. Evde Kechav Mazalis is what we call it. You have to read it, it's very interesting how he describes it all. And he says, this became the modus operandi, the status, this became the, the standard of life and belief systems in the first few thousand years until came Abraham. Abraham was born in the year 1948 from creation, from Adam and Eve, exactly 20 generations after Adam and Eve. Noah was 10 generations from Adam and Eve, and Abraham was 10 generations from Noah. So on the 20th generation, Asen Hagodol, this great uh, force, or this great power, this great strength arose. He describes, he describes uh, Abraham as like the great star, and he began to reverse the process. He challenged the status quo. He challenged this standard of society. You know, paganism was, was dominant. Abraham's father himself was an oil manufacturer. You wanted a god, he had it for you. What do you need today? What mood are you in today? And he had it. So it was the modern day, uh, whatever you want to call it, shamans or the psychics. I mean, you walk down Manhattan, I don't think there's a block that doesn't have a psychic. So you still have these, uh, I know many of us think, hey, who's crazy people going there? But they're, they're paying top uh, rent. So I guess they're paying their bills. You know, after porn on internet, the second most visited sites are horoscope sites, astrology. Because people want to know their future. People want to find anything that's the mysterious, you know, especially if your life isn't working in the conscious levels. You want to figure out what's going on in unconscious level. Someone once came to the Rebbe and asked him about different dreams, dream interpretation. Now we have that in the Bible. Joseph was a dream. And the Rebbe smilingly said, he said, first let's figure out what to do when we're awake before we get to our dreams. You know, especially as the Talmud says, you dream about what you, what you think about by day. So the point being is that um, uh, when life is out of control, we become more dependent, so to speak, on the exotic, I mean, uh, if I title, a, a, and I could tell you from my own experience, you title a lecture, The Secrets of Reincarnation and, and Previous Lives, you have a lot of people coming. If you say, how to be a responsible human being when you're awake, you barely will have anyone come. You say, the Kabbalah of dreams, the Kabbalah of, um, of anything. I, I used to give classes in the open center downtown. So I remember they, uh, you know, they, had, they had different top topics, and one topic they decided to title, Kabbalah for beginners, which I, I discouraged them from using that word, even though I agreed maybe beginners, but I, I didn't think it's. And anyway, what happened was that uh, we had uh, maybe 30, 40 people came. The next time around, I said, make it Kabbalah, advanced Kabbalah. And uh, they had at least 80, 90 people came. Not because they were more advanced, because people, they already know the basics. They want to know the advanced levels, the deeper secrets. And I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just saying that, pe that we do have that tendency of not necessarily knowing how to figure out what's right in front of us. We want to know what's behind us or what's behind the scenes. And um, Abraham, growing up in a home like this, his father was this idol manufacturer, made a big living, a fortune from it. Abraham, as a child already, began to realize this is ridiculous, this, this whole thing. It's like the emperor with no clothes. Everybody was worshiping it. And he realized as a child that something's wrong. There's a lot of stories, some humorous stories about how he would, um, you know, he once went and shattered all the idols of his father's, in his father's warehouse. And his father saw that happen. He came to me, knew it was him. 
So he said to Abraham, why'd you do it? He says, I didn't do it. He said, how did it happen? He said, the idols got into a fight with each other. Who's a better idol, bigger idol? And they killed each other. You know, they started fighting with each other. His father, of course, understood that uh, Abraham was a smart, smart, you know, if he really believed in it, you know, maybe that's what happened. But he's, he knew that he didn't believe in what he was selling. Okay, snake oil. Salesman, that's what they call them. Where's that root from anyway? Snakes don't give off oil or what? Okay, we've got to check out. We always can go to, Ra to the doctor, Rabbi Google, to uh, find out all this information. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Abraham rejected, but what was unique about him was he didn't just reject it, he uh, stood up for what he believed in, and he basically defied the entire world, which is why he's called Avram Ivri. What's Ivri? It's one of the names for Jews is Ivrim, Ivrim, Ivri. Because as the Medrash says, Ivri, that he stood on one side and Me'ever and everybody else in the world stood on the other side. He stood up against an entire world. The first true pioneer, the first true revolutionary. And Maimonides documents all this, as I said in the beginning of Laws of Aved Zarah, that he reversed the process and he began to seek the true God. And he did it through a process of elimination, like all intelligent people would do. He knew it was not these idols. There's no way. They're, they're for sure not it. So then he retraced the steps. So where do you go next? Where do these idols come from? They were representing so-called stars. So he studied the stars. And he studied the sun and the moon. And for a while he thought maybe these celestial bodies carry some divine or some higher power. And then he realized it's just, they're an extension of earth. They're just bigger and larger and more distant. That doesn't make them more divine. So he continued to search and through his process of elimination, he came to discover a tremendous uh, epiphany and insight. And this changed the world forever. It's not the discovery of monotheism, as people like to put it. It was the discovery of what the so-called quote-unquote nature of a true God would be. And that through his process of elimination, he realized the following conclusion. That his whole search is based on a false assumption. Because if God is reality, and we are God's creatures, then... We, what are we doing? We're looking for God. What do we want? A God is a product of our logical search. Our logic and our mathematical equations are all part of God's creation. So the whole cannot be dictated by the part. The part is dictated by the whole. So he realized that mere fact that he, in his own so-called arrogance, but in his own interest, is looking for God may be a big mistake. The way to do it is the other way around, to stop seeking, to shut down all his senses and see what emerges to shut off all the tools and instruments and see what emerges. And that is when he had the first revelation. So Lech Lecha, in last week's chapter, Abraham is leaving his comfort zone. He leaves Atzacha, Malatcha, Besavicha. As I discussed last week, he left basically all forms of subjectivity, three types of major subjectivity that define and distort our lives. One is self-interest, natural self-love, Avas Atzma. We all have a certain matter of self-love which makes us biased and therefore we have our prejudices. A second type of subjectivity is parental influences, besa vicha, parental attitudes, parental influences that shape us when we're in our impressionable years. And three, finally, is atzacha, is um, maladcha is the natural inherent subjectivity and atzacha is social and cultural pressure, peer pressure. The influences of a community, the influences of a society that affect us. And these three forces shape most of our lives. Abraham was told by God, listen, you want to find yourself, to find the true you, and to find the true me, you have to get beyond all these man-made conventions that shape you. Because as long as you're defined by them, then what you're going to find are man-made um, gods. Because you're being shaped by men or by people. So you'll find what is the product of, of man-made things, man-made uh, man creations. You want to find the divine, you have to shut down all these human conventions and human institutions. And that's what Abraham did. And when he shut it all down, by Yeh Allah Hashem, it emerged. It wasn't, we would, you know, in our own materialistic and, um, and uh, a juvenile fashion, we say, okay, you know, I see a window, I see people. So he saw God. Obviously, you can't compare it. But he saw God. 
he experienced divine as much as real as we experience something when we see it. Right now, we're sitting in this room here. You see me, I see you. What do we actually see? So physically, we see the body. You see the body language. You see the shape. You see the color. You see the features of the body, bodily features. But what's really um, interacting with each other right here? Is our bodies are interacting or it's our personalities? You know, when I speak now, what are you really hearing? Are you hearing my body speaking or are you hearing my ideas, spirit, feelings? And when a person speaks from the heart, says, Dvarim ha-yetzim in alav, nechnasim in alav. Speaking, words coming from the heart, enter the heart. What is that exactly? Corpses cannot communicate like that. Two chairs don't communicate like that. Or maybe they do and we don't know. You know? And now this idea is not today, if I said this 150, 200 years ago, that there's an energy coming off of each of us and to each of us. Some people would say there's some type of religious hocus pocus. Today, this is basic science. Basic science. Basic science is that the forces that shape existence are completely invisible. No one has ever seen an atom, and let alone a subatomic particle. It's impossible to see, and it will never be seen. It's not because we don't have the instruments. It's because you're dealing with microscopic dimensions that are simply beyond the senses. So anyway, if you're familiar bit with the quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is completely defies logic. The rules of microscopic quantum mechanics is very different than the rules that we're familiar with. What we call deterministic science, Newtonian physics. In, in quantum mechanics is indeterministic. It's states of probability and so on. I don't want to go into that right now just as an aside, but if you're familiar, these ideas are the foundations of science today. Take medicine. Once upon a time, you talk about a disease, you talk about symptoms. Today, it all comes back down, everyone knows, on a cellular level, on a DNA level. You're talking about things that no human has ever seen. It's all through extrapolation. And these are the forces that we know shape existence. And if someone asks you, so how many layers are there? How deep, how, how far does the rabbit hole go, as they say? The answer is we have no clue. You know, we have no clue, because the deeper you go, you know there must be much more. For all we know, there's sub, 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 uh, uh, infinite amount of sub, sub levels that we may never touch. So what's at the end of the road? What, if you go all the way in, well, maybe that's what God means. And maybe it has nothing to do with our senses. So to say that I have to see God to know that God exists, you know, seeing is believing, frankly, is a ridiculous statement. Love can't be seen. Ideas can't be seen. Pain can't be seen. And yet they're more real than any superficial part of our cosmetic life. Uh, who was it that said it? I think it was Arthur. Sir Arthur. He was a physicist in the, in the 30s, 40s, 30s. And he was asked the question, how do you come to these bizarre counterintuitive conclusions in quantum mechanics when nobody's ever seen an atom? You know, in school, the model for an atom is like a, a cluster of grapes with the black and white, the neutrons and the protons and the electrons spinning around, you know. If you ask any scientist, no one knows it looks like that. It's just a convenient model. It means nothing. It's, no one is, it's, no, it's just a practical model. To, you've got to draw something. So they asked him, no one's ever seen an atom. How could you come to conclusions about things that nobody's ever directly observed? <clears throat> and science is based on observation, not on faith. His answer was a classic, beautiful answer that can be applied very directly straight here. He gave the analogy of a fisherman who spread his net over all the seas and gathered up all types of fish, different species, different colors, different shapes, sizes, and began document. And then he came to a brilliant conclusion that there are no fish in the sea that are shorter than half inch long. I like that. And he's about to make this big announcement to the to the world, when his little daughter tells him, one second, let's see the net you used. And they check out the net, and yeah, the net has spaces of half inch. So what happened to all the fish that were less than half inch? They fell back into the water. So all he has to do is add one important qualification, and that is that when you use a net with half inch spaces, you're never going to find fish that are shorter than half inch long. But you don't need a scientist for that. So in other words, it really comes down to before you make a conclusion to find your instruments. You want to use physical instruments, you'll see physicality. You want to see love? Only love can see love. The same Rebbe Rashab I mentioned before, 
Another story, he was once a child, he was playing with his older brother who was named Rav Zalman Arn, the Razo. And they, you know, children play what they see in their home. Their father was a great Rebbe, so they played Rebbe and Chassid. The Rebbe Rashab, the younger one, dressed up as a Rebbe, and he ended up being the Rebbe. And the Razo dressed up as a Chassid, he comes in, there's a whole bunch of stories of this game they played. And Razo comes in and says to his brother, Rebbe, tell me, what is a Jew, or what is a person? So the Rebbe Rashab answers, the little child answers, the Jew is fire. So he grabs his arm and says his wrist and says, if, if, you're, if a Jew is fire, then why don't I get burned when I touch you? So the Rebbe Rashab answered, because when fire touches fire, it doesn't get burned. You can imagine why he grew up to be who he became. So what do you have? It all comes down to what instruments you use. You know, if you have a sour mood, guaranteed you're not going to be able to see someone else's joy. We have, to be, um, uh, per, uh, we have to be in the same type of state of mind. How many blessings may come your way? I mentioned this last week. People ask for, why is God not answering my prayers? How many blessings or prayers have been answered that you simply were not in the mood of receiving or you weren't even aware of it? I mentioned this couple that I know that, thank God, are happily married today with a few children. But I met them when they first, in their first uh, so-called reincarnation. I don't mean that literally. I mean their first dating uh, scene, when they dated and everyone thought they were a match made in heaven and they decided they're not for each other. He was building a business, she was getting a new job and that's it, and they broke apart. And for years I didn't know what happened. I always said, you know, people wait their whole lifetime to find the right soulmate. These guys, they were, I had no doubt. But then they decided they're not, for whatever reason. And thank God, this is, we're in, the, we're in the rare instances there's a happy ending that they remet years later. He lost his job, business and she lost the job, whatever. They were so distracted, they couldn't even see the blessing that came their way. So I always ask myself, I always think, how many blessings come our way that we ask for or we need? And you're not even there to see because you're looking in the wrong place. Or you're looking the other way. Or you don't think it's the way you exactly wanted it. You're so consumed with your own perception, maybe God gave you what you need, not what you want. So it's all about how we see ourselves and what kind of state of mind we're in. And the emotional state of being. So seeing God could very well be not about, oh, I want to see God. I'm walking down the street, I see here this image, that image, and now I also want to have God on my uh, menu. Maybe seeing God is the opposite. You have to shut down all your senses. Which means, if you close your eyes and your ears, your taste, touch, and smell, tell me, what would you be left with? So initially, whenever I ask this question, the initial knee-jerk reaction when people respond is they think they're going to disappear. You don't have nothing left then. No, you'll just begin the journey of discovering yourself. Because you see, you don't need eyes to see yourself. You don't need ears to hear yourself. Even though I know some people like to hear themselves all the time, but you know what I mean. And you don't need taste, touch, and smell. Like the guy goes on a date, for two hours he speaks about himself, then he turns to the girl and says, okay, enough about me, what do you think about me? You know? <laughs> so that's the formula. It's two basically states of narcissism. One when he talks about himself, and one when he wants to hear about himself. You're psychiatrist. You can analyze that further, right? Okay. Um, so, what will happen if you shut down your senses? It's terrifying initially because you know why? Because our, we're completely um, held hostage by our senses. How our, what we see, what we hear, taste, touch, and smell is constantly overstimulated, especially in our day and age. We rarely have experiences that are not sensory. So what happens to that whole super sensory part of your life? The things that are not visible and they're not audible and they're not tasteable in the other two senses. What happens to all that? They basically pushed aside and you don't even think about it too much except when you start feeling the pangs of some type of anxiety. In Hasidic thought it says anxiety is the voice of the soul demanding attention. You've ignored me long enough, so you start getting anxious because your soul wants to be fed. But we're so preoccupied with, the, as I said, the hyperstimulation of the forces that seduce our senses. You can be immersed in something extremely important, life and death, and you see something that distracts you, you suddenly can completely be distracted by it. That's the world in which we live. Again, if you want to see what we are like, the, better, the best version of us is version A, 
you know, today in, um, in like smartphones or other technology, version 2 is better than version 1, and version 3 is better than f- 2, right? It goes better. When it comes to human beings, I would say version 1 is better than version 2. The farther back you go to your childhood, the more, the more, pure, the more real you are, the way you were meant to be. You were born an original, don't become a copy. So you go to children, what do you see with young children? Look, look at them, look, observe them. Full of enchantment, full of adventure, everything is possible. Until when? Until parents and adults start slowing them down. When they're disappointed. When does a, f- a person begin to lie for the first time? We don't even remember. When's the first time you told a lie? A white lie, a black lie, whatever, a red lie, whatever they're called. How many types of lies are there? When's the first time you were duplicitous? No one's born that way. As a matter of fact, parents are constantly telling their children, don't say everything, because you know, children say what they see. They don't have a duplicitous nature. They learn that from adults. Whenever parents come to me and ask for a blessing for their children, I always say to parents, I bless you that you should not corrupt your children too early. You know, That's what we do. We corrupt our children. When there's so much we can learn from them, because they are closer to God than we are. That's the truth. That's why they imagine better. I, read, I heard this talk, I forgot who it was, a British educational psychologist, a TED Talk, one of the TED Talks, very good one, about education. It says something really you never would think of. And then I thought about Jewish education, of course, but what he said was he traced the roots of our, you know, who, de- who defined the curriculum of a basic public school education today in the Western world. It was basically Napoleon and Frederick the Great, which is why it's called elementary school, because elementary is a military term. They essentially defined education to produce efficient soldiers. So therefore, the main focus in most education systems, in modern Western education systems, is efficiency, mathematics, the hard sciences. Things like arts, music, are all extracurricular um, subjects, hobbies, that you don't... And he says that children are naturally artistic. They're naturally creative. They're not natural accountants and bookkeepers. So it may be good for the tool chest, but it's not essentially the nature of a, of a child is to be very imagination. And he says the imagination is killed in our education system. I mean, you've got to hear the talk. It's a very interesting talk. And it's not a radical talk. It just defines it in a very interesting way. And it's extremely true. And I think about Jewish Judaism, which puts so much emphasis on education, and so much emphasis on our children. There's a verse at the end of Malachi, it says, and the hearts of the parents will return through their children. It's interesting. Usually we think of children being influenced by their parents. Here suddenly the parents are influenced by the children. And the young will lead. There's even an expression which some see as negative and is negative. Chutzpah Yazgit says in the days, the end of time, the end of days, the Talmud says, that there'll be chutzpah, there'll be a lot of nerve. The young will put the old to shame. So on one hand, that's a negative. You know, respect of the elders, etc. But it could also be a positive, because if the elders are corrupt, there's some hope and fresh air in the young people who will rebel against corrupt institutions. So you have something in our own, the child within, which we, each of us has, the child, the inner child, that, is a, that still remembers something that was less jaded and less corrupt, less cynical. You know, as we get older, we start developing resignation and even giving up on many of our hopes and dreams because you experience life. You see, you experience losses. You see that it's not as idealistic as you once thought it was. But it's the greatest people like Abraham that even at age 100, they still had the sparkle in their eyes like at age 5. Because they do not, not, they're not defined by human beings and even the disappointments of human beings because they connect to a God that does not age. And the soul does not age. The soul only gets younger, actually. It's the body that ages. And our attitudes become more body-like as we get older and less soul-like. Children are pure souls. They don't yet know about the body world. Yes, they have physical bodies, obviously. But they're far more spiritual. than. But for them, it's still in, 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 instinctive. It's not developed, doesn't have intelligence involved, but in- instinctively they have a sense of truth. And it's adults that usually mess them up. 
So going back to the theme here, Abraham, Vayar, God appears, you know what happens? He shut down everything and then the real truth appeared. Where is truth? How do you find the truth in anything? You know, we look for the truth. I'm not even talking now on a divine level. Let's just talk about truth in any given situation. How do you know what's your true path? You have two options. Should I go into this business or that business? I should marry this one or that one. I should travel or vi- live here or there. You know, hundreds of decisions we have to make. How do you find the truth? And I'm, of course, there are situations where you may not have an absolute truth, you know. Nothing is perfect. And you, do, you do the best. You weigh the odds, the pros and cons, and you make a decision. But let's say there are areas. How do you find truth in something? You never find it by, 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 discovering, by, uh, by um, acquiring it. You find it by... Um, what's the word I want to use? Um, peeling away the layers of untruths, and truth emerges. When someone says to you, I'm going to sell you the truth, or have the truth to tell you, you rest assured to be pretty skeptical. Look at it from a political, governmental level. What do you have? You have every fascist regime, every totalitarian despot, everyone in history that, what's the first thing they do when they come to power? They establish a bureau of truth and information. The communists were great at it. The Nazis were even better. You know, we, uh, they take control of the airwaves, of television, of media, or whatever it is, because if you control minds, you control people. In, in Russia, so former Soviet Union, there was no news that was allowed in there. My, I remember someone who came and visited Moscow, came back with an English-Russian newspaper, and, I exa- and, and without exaggeration, I saw the newspaper, it was a tabloid. First of all, you know Pravda, which is the main Russian newspaper, you know what it means. Truth. What would you like? What, how, would you subscribe to a newspaper that says truth? This is the truth. The only truth. You know, that alone tells us, gives a giveaway. Someone's going to tell you, I'm going to give you the truth. How much is a subscription? You know? Um, so, and there was also a Yiddish communist paper. It was called Emes. But interesting, Emes was spelled Ayin Mem, Ayin Samach. Okay. So I, I, my, my guess is that the, that the Jewish editor, who probably was coerced to do it, he, you know, he hid it in there by, by spelling it M as any Jew would see M as I M M I N Samach. It's like trying to spell truth, F A L S E. You know, uh, that's what they did, M S. So I saw this newspaper. I couldn't believe it. The headline was a, was a big picture, like a, you know, a half page picture of what, of this like burned out town, you know, with one flickering light, like you know, basically a dead town, and the headline was New York. The last residents of New York have just moved out. That's it. They created a whole myth that New York has become abandoned. And this is what they fed their people. They say Radio Free Europe was the, one of the powerful tools that gave the Russian, the Soviets information from outside. What's the point? The point is a Bureau of Truth and Information, you can rest assured it's not true because it's man, men trying to control the truth. Well, who owns truth? Nobody. How do you know when something is true? Because it resonates. It's not someone's giving it to you. It's always inside of you. It's a question, well, how many layers are blocking it? <clears throat> Resonance. When you hear a song and it touches your heart, no one has to convince you that that song. Now, of course, there's manipulation. People can manipulate. There are good con artists. But real truth always resonates. It resonates from a very deep place. When the greatest compliment you can tell someone is, what you said is nothing new. I always knew it. I just didn't have the words for it. Because truth is inside. And this is a medrash. The medrash says, why did God give the Torah his great gift, the divine mandate, divine wisdom, divine truth to the Jewish people? You know where he gave it to them? In the heat of the Sinai Desert. Now, if you want to give somebody a very special gift, where are you going to give it to them? You take them to a nice, cool restaurant uh, and a uh, nice ambiance, nice environment, God could have taken them to Jerusalem, you know, each Alexandria, Rome, Athens, I don't know, there's a lot of nice cities around. Took them into a wilderness. Who knows what the heat is that time in the morning? It's probably 110, 115 degrees, maybe more. No one ever documented, by the way. Did you ever find, Philip, anywhere, documentation what the weather report was? You know, here, everything's weather reports today. We don't even know what the weather was when they received the Torah. Check it out. Find out what the weather was. Weather.com. Find out, like, 3,348 years ago, whatever. Okay, well, we didn't, I guess more important things were happening than the weather. And it was definitely hot, that's for sure. The heat. 
why would God take them into such a, um, what's the word, hostile, uninhabitable place to give them the Torah? So many reasons are given, but the one that I want to mention is because it's a Mokim Hefker. It's no man's land. Nobody lives in the desert. So no one can lay claim to the Torah. God was trying to prevent that anyone should come and lay any copyright and intellectual property claims. Because if he gave it to Jerusalem, rest assured the Jerusalemites who know how to make a book would say every time you learn Torah, you have to send us uh, 1% or whatever royalties. This way God gave it in a place that is, because truth does not belong to anyone. Even though I don't like Woody Allen's cynical jokes, but this one works here, so I might as well use it. So he has that classic one where the guy comes to the rabbi, Rabbi, I hear that the Torah has all the truth of life. and exi- Absolutely. Will you teach it to me? Sure. How much will it cost? How could I charge you? God didn't charge us. Moses didn't charge us. How could we charge you for the Torah? So the guy's doubly impressed. He's getting the truth. It's free. What do you get for free like that? Something free? It's not truth? Well, they said, this is Woody Al, so you understand the punchline is a little different. So they sit down, of course, the Torah is in Hebrew. And the rabbi says Hebrew lessons will be $20,000. You know. So that's what God did not want. So he gave the Torah in the wilderness. Yeah. And the wilderness, nobody can lay such claims. It's a tremendous lesson. Because it took thousands of years for governments and for institutions to, to embrace the concept of the Bill of Rights that we all have in, in a, inalienable, divine endowed rights. The freedom of speech, the freedom of press. Thomas Jefferson famously said, if I had to choose between a free government and a free press, I would choose a free press because without that there's no free government. So in other words, it's freedom of expression. I remember a number of years ago, it was Seder, Passover Seder. So we all know we asked four questions at the Passover Seder, right? <clears throat> so, being a troublemaker from time to time, I, uh, I thought of a new question, a fifth question. And that is, and I asked everybody at the table, so the more so-called um, devout people said, shh, you're not supposed to talk about the Haggadah. But those that were a little, a little bored um, were inspired by my question. <laughs> <laughs> and the question was the four questions are the following a different order but the order that I grew up with is the tw- we, we uh, dip twice you know Mara and Chareses Karpas and Zalzwas the other way around Mara and Chareses we um, eat matzah and not bread chametz <clears throat> and we eat bitter herbs and we recline so if you look in the Haggadah after the children ask the question, we begin the answers, we begin the whole story. And then, if you look through the whole Agadah, you'll only find two out of the four questions are answered, 50%. <clears throat> why we eat matzah and why we eat mora is answered very specifically. Nowhere is there an answer to the other two questions. Why we dip and why we recline. So my fifth question was, why ask questions and get children to encourage to ask questions when you don't give them answers? So one cynical guy says, very simple, by the time the Haggadah is over, they're all asleep, so they don't know that there were no answers. You know, very cute answer, right? But they'll grow older, and then they'll find out. And I thought about it a lot, and then I realized the answer is a very obvious one. <clears throat> and just to do it, let's think of the plot tickets. You know what the real answer, why, the, why we dip? It's a circular logic thing. We dip in order to provoke children to ask questions, why is this night different? So that's the answer. The answer is to provoke them to ask the question. And that's the answer to this, this question I'm asking. What is it? Freedom, which is Passover. It's the celebration of freedom. The greatest freedom is the right to ask questions. It's not even the answers. The right that you have to challenge, to be able to ask questions. I know this is counterintuitive to many people because they think asking questions is farboten, as they say, forbidden, asr. No, the true freedom is the right and ability to ask questions. It means if I have a question, I have the dignity, the right to ask it. So a healthy skeptic asks questions and is ready for an answer, even if they don't like the answer. An unhealthy skeptic uses questions as excuses and smoke screens. But questions come from a healthy way are necessary. The whole Talmud is based on questions. Nothing is taken for granted. This one says this, and this one immediately argues. And then a counter-argument, a counter-argument, back and forth, back and forth. 
And that's, the, that's what we educate our children from youngest age. Ask questions. You'll find the answer. Shailas chacham chetzi tshuva. The question of a wise person is half an answer. Very many people spend half their lives looking for an answer. Are you really looking for what is the question? Frame the question the right way and you're halfway there. So going back to this, what is truth? Truth is not owned by anybody. Truth is divine. God is the only one that's true. Each of us has a part of God within us, so there's a part of truth within us. And then the rest is history. It's all now covered up in armies of lies. Um, Churchill said during World War II that during war the truth is so precious <clears throat> you have to surround it with an army of lies which is deception, uh, subterfuge, decoys and so, and so on. Um, so truth is inside each of you. The Talmud says that every one of us was taught the entire Torah in our mother's womb. I find that to be a, tr- an, an, a literally a revolutionary Statement. That means everything you need to know, the compass for life, that you'll need to know how to navigate your life, is all inside of you. It's embedded in your psyche. What happens at palm birth, the Talmud says, an angel comes and says, shh, that's why we have a cleft over our lip, and we're made to forget. But the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, asks, what's the point of teaching and, make, and then made to forget? Our conscious minds forget, but our unconscious never forgets, or superconscious. It's like a song. You hear a song, you say, I heard that somewhere. Resonance, back to resonance. So truth is divine. It's not man-made. Good teachers, good parents, healthy people will help us um, peel away the, the lies, the distortions, the, all the forces that cover up real truth. And then it emerges and you know it when it's there. It's like when you have that thing, that epiphany, you know what Abraham came to when he peeled everything away. Which, this is how he discovered God. Not by looking for him, but by doing the opposite. Peel everything away that makes you human. All your, as I said, all those subjective forces, and then truths emerge. This is the secret of real life. You look at all real people, people that have confidence, people that forge ahead, that do not get phased by no matter what happens, you'll see they have this connection to what some people call their peace at their center. And most others are not. We're not at peace. You'll see some people, no matter what happens, especially in times of crisis, they have a certain calm. That calm cannot be created. That calm cannot be fabricated. It comes from a very inner place of a person who just knows certain truths and nothing can shake it. Unfortunately, in our world, we have the opposite. We have hyper-stimulation of our senses. We have so many ways that we think we control life. You can press a button and get anything today. On your mobile phone, you can right now press and you can get any fruit in any season. So it creates a, an illusion of invincibility, of invulnerability. When in truth, in direct disproportion, I don't know if we are better people. Our relationships better because we have better communication tools. I would argue the other way around. I think today, you know, you sit in, in, in meetings, you sit in, and you see people texting, distracted. When's the last time you had a face-to-face conversation with somebody without any distractions? I was sitting, I always tell the story, in a car with somebody. I couldn't get his attention. He's busy on his text. So I, uh, t- so I texted him. And he looks at his text. He's, he's like, something's wrong. You know? Then he realizes it's from me. So he says to me, why are you texting me? You're sitting right near me. I said, because I can't get your damn attention. <laughs> Until finally, um, we had a little conversation, but it didn't last long. So this is the this, this challenge that we have in our time today. We have all these f- gadgets and so many tools that create this illusion that we have it all under control. But do, do we know how to have an intimate conversation? How, how many people are terrified of even staying home because they don't know what to do when they're home? So they have to go out to a party To be at peace with yourself is not such a simple thing. How many people are comfortable in their own skin? And I'm not saying this to be, I'm not, this is not a fire and brimstone uh, sermon, but rather just an observation with with the main focus being that we study in this week's chapter about the greatest pioneer of them all, Abraham, who discovered to be at peace with himself and and in the process changed the world. 
What I find most amazing is that if Abraham was here today, I'm sure he's here in some way, in form or another, would he recognize his grandchildren? Would he be comfortable in the synagogues, in the shuls of his great-grandchildren? You know, because for some reason or other, and there are many ways to analyze it, religion today is actually the opposite of pioneering. It's very conformist-based, it's very ritualistic, and very brainless almost. People committed either by either guilt or obligation or just that's their culture, their comfort zone. And though I'm not saying it's terrible, because listen, if it's a good system and people are moral and ethical, but how long can a system survive an automatic pilot? What Abraham taught was not to be sacrilegious or to be irreverent, but it means to be yourself. I think many people will never admit this, but they think if I was really myself, I would never be connected to God. You know? Because connected to God means I have to be obligations and mitzvahs. If I was on my own and I didn't have to answer to anybody, I wouldn't do anything. To me, that, that means that they have no clue what Judaism is. They have no clue what it is because they think it's a bunch of obligations. When in truth... The story I often tell about the nightingale, that God, when God created the nightingale, um, watch the wires, bro. The nightingale, so the nightingale has a beautiful voice. And um, so God said to, so the nightingale said to God, thank you very much for this beautiful voice you gave me. But I need tools, I need uh, weapons to protect myself from predators and enemies. So God offered the nightingale, you know, I may be perched on a branch, serenading in the night, and an animal searching for a good meal, suddenly attracted to my voice, give me something to protect myself from my enemies. So God offered the bird a beak, you know, a beak, a sharp beak. A beak is a, is a, uh, is a is well, somewhat of a defense. The bird examined the merchandise and said, for a beautiful, ele- elegant bird like me, a nose like that, no, no. Okay. So then God offered the bird a uh, set of claws. Again, sharp claws. Again, the bird rejected for the same reason. It's not, not becoming. So finally, God said to the bird, okay, I'll give you a set of wings. Knafayim in Hebrew, Wings. The bird looked at the wings and said something I don't understand. You're the master of the universe. You created the world with such elegance and design. I have enough body weight as it is, and you give me two extra pieces of flesh, make it more difficult for me to escape. So God, of course, said to the bird, no little bird, these are called wings. And when you learn to use them, you can soar and fly away from any enemy. And I've used this story a number of times. So, um, when you look at, ostensibly, at Judaism, Torah mitzvahs, it's full of obligations. You may not even know the extent of how much it regulates. Everything in life, from the moment we wake up till we go to sleep, even as you sleep, we're always responsible. How we're born, how we die, love, sexuality, what we eat, how we eat. It even controls, frankly, it even tells you how to cut your nails. And what, what shoelace to tie first? You didn't know that, I'm sure. Yeah, and it gets even more detailed, especially you get to the laws of Pesach. So someone can think, if you're just to step back a moment, what is this? What's this? A body of, of, of unbelievable obsession of details. And what's the meaning behind it all? It's just, just burden, it's extra weight. That's when you see the material, the body side of Judaism. But then there's the soul, there's the wings. If you're able to see how these are tools and wings that help you fly to places you can never reach on your own, that's a whole different story. How many many of you have taken music lessons, play instrument? Okay. It takes years of discipline, which frankly is not comfortable. But you learn a language. So when you're sitting in the discipline part of it, you think, well, it's not worth it. But then when you hear the magic that comes from an instrument, a piano, a violin, so someone looks at musical notes and doesn't know how to read them, and it's gibberish, a bunch of scriggle. But then you suddenly see someone play it, and you see, wow. <clears throat> someone offered you 100 pounds of stones, carried from here to here, and then it belongs to you. Most of us will reject it. What do we need stones for? 
But if someone said 100 pounds of diamonds, everyone would say, give me 200 pounds. Now, 100 pounds of diamonds don't weigh more than 100 pounds of stones. I'm sorry, the other way around. They don't weigh less. But the value overshadows the effort. And that's the secret. Understanding Judaism as a set of wings of music that can lift you to places you can never reach. Then the details are just the method. The, those are the instruments. Those are the tools. Those are the methods, the methodologies. <clears throat> and that is the key element of finding really what truth is about. So when someone is able to connect on that level, everything changes. So if Abraham came here today, what would he see? He'd see definitely people following, circumcising their boys like Abraham did. <coughs> He'd see many other rituals and mitzvahs that he'd identify with. But the question would he identify with our leaders and with our rabbis and with our sp- spirits? The children I have no problem with. I'm sure he's connected to them. But the rest of us. So how this became a system of conformity, not for now, we can discuss it. But it was never meant to be. The Jew came to this world to change the world, not to become part of the world. We've become part of it many times. Changing the world means that you always stand above it. And yes, you have to be immersed in, uh, involved in, in survival, a parnas and make a living and make ends meet. That's necessities. That's not your life. That's just the means. The end is to change the universe, to change the world. And not just the Jewish world. And not just your community and not just your home. It's the whole world. That's what Abraham did. Four billion people on this earth attribute their faith to the first man called Abraham. <clears throat> so the bottom line lesson of all this, this week's chapter is that all of us can shed a tear or two like the Rebbe Hashab did. Why God doesn't appear to us. But there's a way to get God to appear to you. You have to get out of the way. You have to get your uh, man-made um, tools and man-made conventions and all your routines and habits. You free yourself from that, trust me, you'll have a moment of truth. You'll have a moment of God. It doesn't work the other way around. It's not like, oh, you know what? Hey, God, appear to me. It's about what, is, is there room for him to appear? The Kotzka Rebbe once said, they asked him, Where's God? And he said, wherever you let him in. The Talmud says that God and an arrogant person cannot rest under one canopy. Because there's no room. If your cup is full, there's nothing, what's going to enter? So the first step, and I would say this to anyone who's looking for any type of transcendence, or I don't like the word salvation, too uh, not Jewish, liberation, redemption. The first step to any healing to any growth is always one, one thing and one thing only. That you're not so sure of yourself. If you think you're 100% right and that you have it all figured out, that's the biggest enemy to any movement. Because then you're, you know, you're all full of yourself and your approach and your opinion. And the problem is always somebody else. It's what's called in Hasidic language, bittel. The ability to be a clay rake or an empty vessel that's receptive to another way of looking at things. And the logic is, is um, the logic is, uh, what's the word I want to use? Is, uh, is not infallible. Is, in, uh, is absolute. What is the logic? If you have a problem and you think you're not part of the problem, how do you think you're going to solve it? As some scientists say, you cannot solve a problem from within the same system that created the problem. Now, the problem is inside your system. If you so convinced you're right, as they say in the healing system, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Every infection begins to heal when there's fresh air. If it is in a closed environment, in a ghetto-like environment, in a type of recycled air, so every infection will fester. And psychologically and emotionally, it's even more so. So the mere fact, as the Talmud says, if a person is anxious, yasicheno. So what does yasicheno mean? So there are two interpretations in the Talmud. One says yasicheno from the word sicha, with a sin, to speak about it. To go consult, to speak with someone else about it. And another interpretation is yasicheno with a samach, which means hesachadas, 
Distract yourself. Masiyach dat. Distract yourself from it. So the Reb Marash was a, uh, once asked the question, uh, aren't these two interpretations contra- contradictory? If you speak about it, you're dwelling on it. If you're distracting yourself, you're avoiding it or pushing it aside. And his answer is brilliant, the basis of all therapy. That by speaking about it, you free yourself of it. You can give it away in a sense, and then you can distract yourself. If it sits in you, it becomes an obsession. You get consumed with it and it eats away and eats away. So breaking the silence, what they call, and opening up, that already is fresh air. Because silence is where infections fester. These big secrets, you never spoke to anyone, you never shed a tear. You weren't even allowed to express pain or hurt over something that happened. They say the silence is worse than the rape. Because the crime is the crime, but then if the cover-up doesn't even give you the dignity to acknowledge that it hurts. And they tell you, no, nothing happened. That can be far worse than the original crime. Not necessarily worse in the, in the, in the literal sense of it, but worse in, its, in the damaging effects. Invalidation. So it all begins with Allah lecha, to get out of our comfort zone. And when you do that, you have a, your path to God. <clears throat> so it's more sophisticated and more complicated. <coughs> I'm fine. Than just saying, oh, I, 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 I have faith in God, have trust in God. I find that everybody would love to be able to have faith in God. They may not say it because I said God has gotten a very bad name, a black eye due to all the misrepresentation by false prophets and false uh, leaders. So like the real God, may the real God rise, where I said, the bad ditchover said, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in. But everybody in some way has some type of belief in something that's deeper than just what you see. There's a doctor that comes off into this class, not here now. He's a research doctor and he decided, he calls himself an atheist, but he comes here, he likes, I ask him, how do you reconcile coming here? And he says, your God I, I'm comfortable with. Okay, there you go. So I said that, I, used to, I always argue with him. Um, because he, he took upon himself a few illnesses, not such common ones. He's going to conquer in his lifetime. He's researching to eradicate them. You know, some more obscure ones. I don't even remember their names. And I said, how are you so sure? You work day and night. You're spending who knows how much. How do you know? Maybe some illnesses can be conquered. Everything can be conquered. So I always laugh and tell him, you know, you're the most radical believer that I ever saw, more than all the religious people. He calls it the power of healing power of nature, whatever you want to call it. Just another name. So the problem I find is that people don't know, they don't know what God is or they don't know how to believe in themselves and in the deeper truth. Because as I said, it's been so contaminated and so, um, so damaged by, so, by, by the, those that fed it to us. You know, which of course is extremely sad and tragic. <clears throat> so the challenge is, is how to help people not allow themselves to be trapped by their preconceived notions, their stereotypes, their prejudices, their attitudes. And not imposing it on anyone. It's about helping people just find comfortable ways to access a deeper dimension of themselves. And that includes, of course, cleaning the passages, clearing the so-called blocked arteries, and with resonating messages that you can work with and slowly build. And as you begin to breathe again, or breathe fresh air again, Every infection and all your, pre, your past can be addressed. I'm not trying to suggest it's so simple. But it's not just, okay, have faith in God, believe it. That's good. But we have blocks. There are reasons we have difficulty with God. Because we have many blocks to what is true, what is pure, what is divine. Too many things have happened in our lives that don't let us relate to purity. You know what I mean? Look, let's be honest. Someone went, went through school, whatever school it is. And then the people you thought were heroes and role models, you suddenly realize they're low lives. Or you see different disappointments, hypocrisies. For an impressionable teenager or impressionable child, these are devastating moments. They may not be devastating in, the, in, in, in pure firepower at the time, but they devastate because they create a, um, they jade you. They create a certain cynicism. Oh, you know what? I can't trust anybody. All that I believed in. Ah. You know, thank God, I could tell you my own teen, teen years, I never had this problem, not because I believe, because I never trusted anybody in the first place. So I never got disappointed in anyone. But I had friends that really were shattered. 
not openly, but I see something broke in them when they were they, when like, you know they confided confided in a mentor, and then that mentor like embarrassed them or humiliated them or broke this broke the confidence. These things are very disturbing. It's not it's not necessarily that it's how big the confidence was. It was that means you start losing trust, and once you lose trust, you start wondering who can I trust. It's similar to the same idea. Somebody meets someone else, they fall in love, they get married, and then they end up hating it, becoming enemies. And the relationship is destroyed. What happens next time around? It's like when your hand breaks, you're not ready to go do the same thing again. And something dies inside of a person where they're not ready to give the benefit of the doubt. This time much more skeptical. And sometimes things shut down. I see people with such layers of armor. No way you can pierce. But nothing can get in, but nothing gets out either, you know. It's a two-way street. And it's sad. And I'm not suggesting, oh, you know, just let down your guard and just... Obviously, if you've been hurt, protect yourself. But don't become your own worst enemy by locking everything up and saying, you know, it's all over. Many people don't want to have children because they were hurt as children. I've heard this so many times. It breaks your heart that to that extent they say, I don't want to bring children because I'm afraid I'll do to them what was done to me. And when you say... Don't do to them. That's where your ability to, to, to create tikkun, repair. You know, what are you going to create a vicious cycle? <clears throat> but they're terrified. And I'm not, I'm not judging. I understand where it's coming from. I mean, actually, I don't understand because I didn't have that personal experience, but I, I mean, I can relate to it. <clears throat> so what do you have to do in a situation? You have to find deeper levels in that side, that person, that they should have the courage and strength to, you can't just say, you know, it's foolish what you're saying. It's not foolish. It's coming from a real pain. But you have to find deeper strengths that are deeper than the pain. It's like going dig deeper. But this is all hard work. This is the essence of why we need God. You know, to me, I don't believe in getting into empirical arguments about God. For every proof there's a God, you can always bring a proof there's no God. Those that believe in God have to deal with the Holocaust and evil and the good things happening to bad, the bad things happening to good people, etc. But, but there's something else about God that's far more than just a mathematical or a scientific uh, proofs. And frankly, let, let's be honest, and even if you could mathematically prove God, you want a God that's pro- a product of a mathematical equation? That's what God we want. We want a God that put us here, not we put God here through our mathematical equation. That's what Abraham discovered. That he's going to define what God is. If God is really God, God defines us. We don't define God. It's like the Torah says, God created us in His image. We don't create God in, his, in, in our image. That's the whole difference between idolatry and self-worship and worshiping something greater than us. The real argument that I make is not really an argument. It's about experiential. If you're not going to trust in something that's greater than us, tell me, how are you ever going to get out of any real situation that you get stuck in? Maybe we are damaged goods. Maybe we are ultimately irreversible problems. Maybe, yeah, I grew up in a home where a guy will argue or a girl will argue that I grew up in a home that was very destructive and I don't want to bring children to the world. What hope can you give them? But if you tell them, you know what? There's a God, there's a soul inside of you that's deeper than all the pain. It gives you something to hold on to. To me, that makes it worth it. I don't know if this is a uh, so-called scientific argument, but it's definitely a practical one. Because it means that we can hold on to something that's greater than us. And when you can hold on to something that's greater than you, that is, in an existential world, with all its hostility and pain and survival of the fittest that we live through, is a, is a ray of hope. And I have no doubt that's why Jews are here today, because they held on to it no matter what. With all the persecutions and all the genocides and all the, the, the expulsions and all the, all the discrimination, they always had something, as they say by Hasidim, when you're tied above, you don't fall below. You don't have something above, how, how can you not fall? The great Roman Empire, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, all the great empires, they had nothing above. So all they had was what they had. And then it ran out, like anything. You know, you could have millions of gallons of fuel, but then it runs out. Everything material runs out. When you have that spiritual connection, it, is, it actually is immortal and eternal, and in some way makes you eternal. Not necessarily that you live forever, but your beliefs live on forever. And it's not you, it's your children. And if it's not your children, it's your grandchildren. When we believe in Mashiach, the logic of it is so uh, beautiful. It's not some type of superstitious belief. It's the belief that our actions matter and the world will change and ultimately our dreams will be realized. 
It's saying that our parents and grandparents didn't waste their lives. You know, any cynic can ask the question, and I'm sure everybody has asked it at some time, what difference does it make if you're a good person or a bad person? We're all going to be eaten by the same worms after 120 years. I don't mean to be so graphic. You know? <clears throat> What's the answer? So some say, okay, it just feels better to be good. But what would you tell your children if they asked you this question? Or you ask yourself this question. So some say it just feels better to be good. It's just the right thing to do. Uh, some make the argument, listen, uh, uh, what, I mean, there's all kinds of arguments. I feel guilty if I'm not moral. But these are all subjective arguments. The ultimate answer is, because, no, it lives on forever. It makes no difference what happens to you physically. It means the mitzvah you did, the good deed you did, the sacrifices, releases, as the Kabbalists put it, an energy that changes the world forever. The fact that you don't see it yet, we don't see a lot of things. And Mashiach is the realization of all those energies accumulating and erupting. It's actually quite, to me, it's a beautiful concept. That I, to me, the only thing that makes sense why we should pay a price. You know, you see all kinds of people. If you can get away with crimes and nobody knows, why not? The answer is because there's no such thing. It makes no difference what people know they don't know. It's about eternity. And it's about changing things for the better forever. So when you have that type of concept, you can imagine how Abraham had the strength to stand up to a world. Nothing would phase it. It made no difference. I mean, I, you can't, I don't know if there was a person as great as he was in that sense. Because today, even in later years, there were people. That once Abraham set in motion, Abraham had no synagogues. He had no teachers. He had no rabbis. Maybe that was good, actually. He had no one to turn to except his search for truth. And the Rambam gives him the greatest compliment at the end of the laws of Tshuva, the Rambam writes, that everybody on earth, even the greatest tzaddikim, all do things for ulterior motives. Some do it for physical reward, some for spiritual reward. Except one man that God called him Avram Avi, the man who loves me, my beloved. He committed to truth because it was true. You're not going to find very many people that do that. I mean, we all like to talk, we all talk a big game, you know, but he, he committed truth because it was true. That's because he connected to something that was not man-made. There's the story with the Blazhna Rebbe, I think <clears throat> he was in the camps. I mention the story very often because it just it captures the point so well. And he, um, um, so he was there with one of some of his chassidim. This particular concentration camp, the Nazi commandant, there, the commander there was commander, whatever they're called. Um, was uh, they were all cruel. He was he had his own cruelty, and he had this game he liked to play. He had the Jews dig trenches, deep trenches, wide trenches, and said whoever can jump over this trench lives, and whoever doesn't is shot. And so called the game began. So one of the Hasidim says to the Rebbe, Rebbe, you know enough of this torture and this humiliation. Let's just allow ourselves to be killed. It's over with. And the Rebbe said, no, as long as we're alive, we have to do everything possible to stay alive. We don't know God's plan. And the game began. And in the havoc and the mayhem, nobody knew what happened, who lived, who died. Anyway, a few months later, the camps were liberated, and they both survived. They met later, and the Rebbe says, the Chassid says to the Rebbe, Rebbe, you're not a young man. How did you uh, make, how did you jump over that trench? He said, well, I closed my eyes and I held on to the kapota, to the coattails of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather and gave me the strength to jump over. And then he turned to the chassid and said, how about you? How did you jump? He says, I held on to your kapota. I held on to your coattails. The greatest strength a person has is the humility to know that ein chavush matir satsme, that no one in fetters, no one that's tied up can untie themselves. We are all fragile human beings. It makes no difference how much you've accumulated, how many connections, how much money. We're all fragile human beings. The only thing that frees us is when we recognize it and we realize holding on to the coattails, holding on to those that was great, standing like midgets on the shoulders of giants, continuing a tradition that's been here for thousands of years, and holding on to that is what keeps us going even when it's difficult. You'll see across the board, Anyone that goes through difficult times, why some people get shattered and some people make it? Somewhere you dig and you'll find something they're holding on to. <clears throat> it may be in their genes from their parents. It may be 
friends, it may be something in their belief system. I mean, it talks about logotherapy. Viktor Frankl, who studied Holocaust survivor, victims and survivors, he was there. That was his basic, his whole, he built a whole uh, psychology of logotherapy based on what? Man's search of meaning. That he said that more than anything else, it was those that had meaning and purpose. Even if they didn't know what the purpose was, even if it was tragic, because the Holocaust was tragic, are the ones that in some way were able to make it. It's not because they found a reason for the Holocaust, God forbid. No one knows why. But they recognize there's a deeper destiny, there's a higher meaning to everything in life. And those are people who hold on to the, that kapot, the coattails. And never underestimate it. You know when it's hardest is when things are going well. Think, hey, I don't need anybody. You know, I'm a self-made person. yodi. That's when it's hardest. When things are not going well, obviously everybody's reaching and trying to lean on someone. But when things are going well, that's when you have to be wise to fortify and build those foundations. Or, and foundations like, like roots. Deep roots um, create beautiful fruits. It's my original uh, rhyme. <laughs> Nothing special. But uh, that's how it is. So a tree is the only thing that grows in two directions. Deep down and right up. And the deeper down it grows, the higher it grows up. That's the secret. So we have, thank God, we had a great-grandfather called Abraham. We have his genes. So somewhere deep inside you, you have an Abraham waiting to be released. And now it's up to us to uh, get rid of the layers that block his, uh, his emergence. So God should bless everybody to have the strength, the courage. And this maybe is one of the reasons we read the Torah and we stick to it every week. Not just to read what happened, but you know, we have something, Eitz Chaim Hila Machzikim Ba. It's a tree of life to those that hold on to it. You know, Simchas Torah, we clutch it and dance with it. And all the time we're, we embrace it. It's like holding on to something that's greater than we are and allowing it to carry us. You know, knowing that this Torah from God traveled with us through the generations. It's exactly the same Torah that Moses wrote thousands of years ago, word, letter by letter. He wrote it handwritten, and every Sefer Torah is handwritten exactly compared to a Torah before it. It can be photocopied. Facts, it has to be proofread by a previous Torah. It's amazing. Every Torah, in any type of synagogue, any denomination, it's the same Torah scroll with the 304,807 letters. And they, we count Seferim. Why are they called Seferim? Because we count. We know the exact number. So, God shall bless us all. Each of you have a week that you can build, build those foundations, whether it's a class you go to or it's another commitment. The things that um, keep you going are the things you commit to that are stronger than you are. And then they hold you more than you even hold them. And uh, we will have a class, of course, next Wednesday, as usual. If I don't have your email address, please leave it so we can stay in touch. I send out also a weekly email, which I'll be happy to send to you. And um, Philip, who's here, gives his Thursday night class. If anybody's interested, just get in touch with our office. Meaningfullive.com is the website. And myself and my whole team are here in any way, as I said at the opening, to uh, we intersect. It's a great honor to and and uh, to be part of your journey, and I hope you feel the same about myself and what we do. And uh, hopefully, we continue this journey for many healthy years. And remember, you have to be influencers. The more you influence others, less you'll be influenced by them. So, mashpiim to give. Givers, not just takers, and that requires a certain. You'll see the best givers are the people who are very secure and confident with themselves. Those that hoard and have to constantly play defense are usually not so secure. Anyway, it should be a very blessed week. We can hold on to your coattails, not your coattails, someone else's <coughs> coattails. And um, until next week, everyone, have a good week. Thank you very much. <laughs>